Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Hope Route, a place to connect, a place to converse, a place to share and find hope. Benjamin Franklin um, is, um, to, um, you know, we we uh, we are told that Benjamin Franklin said that there is um, there are some things that are certain. Many things are uncertain, but two things are certain: death and taxes. And uh, I would say that um, also crisis is something certain. I remember someone saying that everyone is in the middle of a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or going into uh, a crisis right now. So uh, we are faced with challenges. Our life is uh, um, a, a roller coaster with uh, crisis and uh, maybe. Uh, things to celebrate, uh, joys, uh, and then crisis again. Uh, so here we are with a new series. Uh, the Hope Route team um, is, uh, is here with a new series entitled uh, Navigating Life's Crisis, Fearless or Fearful. We are going to have six presentations. This time we have um, some guest speakers coming in, some guest presenters. Um, some doctors, uh, psychologists, uh, theologians, pastors, and they are going to talk about different um, fears that we are facing in our lives. Fear of contagion tonight, fear of illness, loss, unknown, fear of, fu of the future, and also fear of God. And uh, you are invited to interact with us by sending questions in, by commenting right under the, um, the stream, whatever you, you are. We also have, uh, for uh, most of the nights, we are going to have a health nugget, uh, meaning uh, a short video talking about uh, um, something uh, that we can implement in our lives and improve our health. And we're going to uh, dive right in using the first health nugget um, and is going to deal with uh, the benefit of taking a walk after a meal. Here it is. Hi, I'm Dr. Wes Youngberg, and I work with people who are at high risk for serious COVID-19 complications. Today, I want to share one of my favorite health secrets with you. Many studies are showing that people with elevated blood sugars are having some of the worst COVID-19 outcomes. High blood sugars cause damage throughout the body and weaken the immune system. Many people take insulin or oral medications to control their blood sugars, but lifestyle habits like nutrition, exercise, and sleep habits also play a big role. Everyone knows that exercise is important, but did you know that the timing of your exercise can strongly impact your blood sugars? Your blood sugar spike the highest about one hour after you eat. If you have diabetes, prediabetes, or are overweight, these glucose spikes can have many negative effects on your body and on your immune response. One of the best ways to avoid high blood sugar spikes is to take a walk immediately after you finish eating. If you do this, your muscles will start to burn off some of that glucose that rises in your bloodstream right after the meal. This will prevent your blood sugar from spiking as high as it could have otherwise. In fact, I've tested the blood sugars of thousands of my patients one hour after their meals to compare the impact of after meal exercise versus being sedentary after eating. Patients can often lower their potential blood sugar spike by one to three points for every minute of walking. This means that if you're diabetic and you're struggling with high blood sugars, a 30 minute light walk immediately after eating could lower your after meal blood sugars by nearly 100 points. One way to think about this is that you're flattening the curve of your blood sugars, and in doing so, you're flattening the curve of COVID-19, which will help enhance your immunity and 
after a meal exercise also helps reduce the risk for weight gain, heart disease, cancer, and many other chronic conditions. This is a good habit for everyone to practice, whether or not they have high blood sugars. For best results, try to walk after as many of your meals as possible for at least 10 or 20 minutes. If you're diabetic, 30 minutes is even better. Other forms of light exercise can work at that time as well. God is always on the front line working to keep us well. He created our bodies to move so why not move after your next meal? Well, um, I uh, can uh, testify to that. I, I see benefit in uh, taking a walk, especially um, on weekends when uh, I tend to maybe overeat a little bit um, and maybe at potlucks at church. Uh, and then uh, if I lay down, I, I don't feel good at all. So taking a walk is definitely a, a big plus for me. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you find something useful for yourself in this. And without further ado, let's um, uh, invite uh, um, Dr. Eddie Ramirez. Uh, he's a medical doctor, research scientist, published author, and international speaker. He has 27 years of experience working in lifestyle centers worldwide, applying thera therapeutic modalities to different medical problems. He has more than 100 studies in the scientific literature documenting the effect of lifestyle changes on different pathologies. He is the co-author of the third edition of the textbook of lifestyle medicine of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and also the book, Rethink Food Together, uh, Rethink Food, together with uh, Neil Barman, Michael Greger, Hans Deal, Joel Foreman, and other lifestyle medicine leaders. Uh, we want to welcome him and uh, he's gonna talk to us uh, on the first uh, fear, which is um, the fear of contagion. And I want to ask him as he comes in, uh, as a doctor, Dr. Ramirez, welcome. And as a doctor, international speaker, uh, you travel, uh, I, I understand extensively, and also deal with sick people on a regular basis. Um, are you afraid of getting sick or getting contaminated? Um, that's a good question. There's always a possibility of that. But to say that I'm a, uh, that I'm afraid um, would be an overstatement. So okay. I know that uh, when I have a mission, there's a reason why the doors open and I just go forward and, and trust, you know, that everything is going to be all right. Thank you, doctor. Um, before we uh, give you the, uh, the full attention, let's, uh, let's ask the Lord uh, to bless our meeting tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege to be together. Thank you for uh, Hope Route and the team. Thank you for the presenters, their willingness to spend some time with us and share and also um, interact with us through question and answer. Bless Dr. Ramirez tonight and uh, let uh, the uh, materials that he's going to share with us, the information that he's going to share with us, benefit us and uh, improve our health and, uh, and our overall being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Dr. Ramirez, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. And yes, it's a, a privilege to be here with you. Uh, welcome all of you. Um, it's been uh, 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 a while that I've uh, spoken to our friends there in Chicago. So you're all more than welcome. I'm the director of a lifestyle medicine organization by the name of HealthWise in Eastern Pennsylvania. And uh, I have uh, uh, some published papers. Uh, these are some of it. You can see them uh, on, uh, on the screen. Uh, this one is about COVID-19, how one of the keys 
happen to be your immunity. And one of the things you can use to stimulate your immunity is hydrotherapy. In this peer review article, I'll tell you in a little, uh, in a minute, uh, where you can get the, the full copy and, and read it. We use something by the name of hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy is the wise use of hot and cold interventions. There's a lot of research on this. This stimulates your immune system and it's very useful to strengthen the immune system and also as a treatment for COVID. Uh, Finnish people are the leaders worldwide, no question about it. For them, um, interventions such as sauna, they're part of their daily routine. All of them, you know, in Finland, every single Finnish people at least once a week use a sauna. And fascinating statistics regarding car coronavirus in Finland. They had coronavirus, no question about it. But three quarters of the people that die of coronavirus in Finland is because it's the foreigners, the ones that are dying. Three quarters of them are foreigners. In other words, they don't have that culture of the sauna and so forth. And that uh, secondarily, you know, affects immunity and puts them at higher risk. And also um, the, uh, the second part of the study we did, we took a group of people with COVID-19 and we applied them um, hydrotherapy. And we were showing how this actually helps the patient uh, heal faster from the COVID-19. That's a second study will be published in that one later. And also, um, I wrote this uh, guide uh, together with Dr. Roger C. Holt. I highly recommend uh, you find his uh, videos online. He's a pulmonologist from uh, Southern California. And in this guide, we're focusing on evidence-based things you can do to improve your immunity. This free guide, you can download it. I'll tell you in a minute in a link I'm going to give you. And this is another fantastic news. I just finished writing a book about pandemics. We sent this book to the print shop literally last Wednesday. So this book is not necessarily about COVID-19, even though it covers a little bit about it, but rather is showing us the situation that we're at. See, since 1960s, there are 40 new, what are called emerging diseases. These diseases, we didn't know they existed. We didn't know anything about it. They are completely new. COVID-19 is one of those emerging diseases. And... Um, the reality is that we are expecting other new emerging diseases. This has to do with the way we treat uh, many things in this planet. But um, in order to prepare yourself for those new pandemics, we wrote this book about that. These are practical things. This book doesn't talk about vaccines and masks and all these things. Those things have their place. This happened to talk about the practical things you and I can do to strengthen our immunity. It talks about the hydrotherapy that I was talking to you a minute ago. It talks about forest bathing, different strategies you can do to deal with stress, things that have been proven regarding diet and all kinds of things. 22 chapters. Uh, this is a, a book that is written for the general public. You don't need to have a high degree to understand it. Very nicely illustrated throughout the whole book. Go to the go website pandemicbusters.org if you want to know more information. There's a Kindle version also coming out um, in a few days. So the research I was showing you about the hydrotherapy, the guide that you can download that I mentioned to you, and more than 140 published studies, you can find them on my ResearchGate page. Just put on your Google Francisco Ramirez ResearchGate, and that'll take you to that repository. There's more than 140 studies there. There's also a very active Twitter account, Eddie R D 
MD. I travel very much. Just this year alone, I already been in five countries. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be uh, traveling to Kenya and Ethiopia to do a series of seminars there. So you can, you know, learn what the seminars are and so forth. Many times it's available, you know, the possibility of catching those online. You can find that information there on that Twitter account. I also have a YouTube page with videos from many languages and also on Instagram if you want to come and travel with me as I go and see things around the world. So my topic today is answering that fear of contagion with psychoneuroimmunology. So we'll be uh, learning about a new concept by the name of psychoneuroimmunology. I hope you have a pa paper and um, a pen so you can take some notes as you will be learning very good new information. So this microscopic creature by the name of coronavirus, this is an actual microscopic picture of it, um, has caused all kinds of trouble. And it is a dangerous virus. I am not putting that down. But the reality is that the media thrives on fear, thrives on making people, you know, uh, afraid and, and, and manipulating the behaviors. And the reality is, you know, there were some fascinating statistics just came out a couple of weeks ago from the CDC, you know, documenting what has happened during last year. Did you know that things like heart disease, which is actually the number one killer in this country, actually went up during last year. Cancers went up last year. Um, diabetes went up this last year. Alcohol use went up last year. Respiratory diseases not related to COVID-19 went up last year. Yet, what do we find on the media? COVID, COVID, COVID. What about these other topics, you know, that are killing many of our dear ones? How come we don't hear much about it? The same story, because fear sells. As this uh, lady uh, wisely said, if you are afraid to live your life because you might die, then you have already died. And that's the sad reality. When fear comes in, a part of our brain called the amygdala fires up and our thinking becomes irrational. That's why we shouldn't get into a status of fear. Or as uh, Six Sigler said, uh, an author I really appreciate, Fear has two meanings. Forget everything and run or face everything and rise. The choice is yours. That is a fantastic um, summary of what we are going to talk about. So when the amygdala runs the show, our thinking becomes irrational and our decisions may not be the best. So rather than live without fear, let us rise and go forward with the situation. And the problem of being under the state of fear is that the set of hormones that we have that are supposed to control when something is really, really bad to help us save our lives. For example, in the old days, when your relatives and my relatives, you know, were um, people working in agriculture, they were there, you know, in a new place, uh, homesteading and so forth. And then let's say a bear, a bear just showed up. Well, your body would have this response 
of the hormones, certain uh, stress hormones will kick in, and those hormones will actually prepare you for action. Either you would face that bear and try to fight it, or you would have the capacity to run faster than usual to get out of that situation. But in today's society, the animal attack, they still happen, but there are things that are very, very rare. We turn on that system on a civilized setting where there is no need to be, you know, physically attacking uh, a mountain lion or something along the lines. So what do we do? We don't move. We don't do exercise. And that is just like a pressure cooker. And our brain starts going haywire secondary to that. And you can literally see um, the signs of fear on the person. You can actually measure that in saliva. You can actually see it in the eyes. You can see it in the skin. You can even see it when somebody has this type of chronic type of fear, their muscle stands and even their posture changes. Their head goes forward. And this even stimulates things such as inflammation, which increases your risk of cancer, which increases your risk of heart disease, and all kinds of problems secondary to that. So today we're going to learn what is this psychoneural immunology. Basically, what it means, it's three words there. We have the psycho, our mind, we have the neuro, our brain, and we have the immune system. How our thinking affects our brain, which in turn affects our whole humanity. And this is a well uh, recognized peer review. There's a lot of research on this subject. Dr. Solomon is the first one that proposed this in the scientific literature. He uh, wrote a paper that was published on YAMA. YAMA, you know, is a, one of the top medical journals in the world by the name of Emotions, Immunity, and Disease. And he was just hypothesizing. He was just speculating by his, you know, uh, clinical practice. He saw this. And you even know this, how this actually happens. For example, if you have a, a, a friend of yours that is going through, you know, a difficult uh, you know, relationship, divorce and lots of fighting and so forth at home, What's going to happen to that person? Is that person going to be like super happy and so forth? No, that, that troublesome situation that they are in, it's going to have an effect on their mood and it's going to have an effect on their immunity. Those persons are very high risk of getting, you know, like a flu or something along those lines. Now, when he proposed this, there was no clinical trials about it. Then using that idea that Dr. Solomon had proposed, clinical trials started to be done to try to prove if this idea was true or not. Now, the interesting thing is that Dr. Solomon was not the first one in the medical history to propose this. In the second century, um, the, uh, there were uh, doctors in, 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 the, in Rome that wrote books. And today we have access to those books. One of those doctors is Dr. Gallen. And he observed how depressed women were at higher risk for cancer. And now we actually know that. By the way, 
if you're somebody that is uh, struggling with cancer, I'm going to give you a hint. You need to take care of your mood because if your mood is not well, your immunity actually goes down. And now, you know, we have tests that we're able to do on people doing this type of clinical trials, and we have been able to document why cancer increases on somebody that is in constant fear. And the reason why this happens is because our body is interconnected. For example, we have nerve um, cranial nerve number 10 is called the vagus nerve. It's a nerve that originates in your brain and goes to all kinds of organs in you. That's the reason why when you're like really, really stressed, what happens? You cannot even eat well. You know, your hunger goes away or if you eat, you're going to have indigestion because that vagus nerve is communicating that stress of the mind into your digestive tract and the digestion cannot take place correctly. And that's why there's a lot of wisdom in this citation to deal with minds is the greatest work ever committed to men, men, character, and personality. So one of the ways that we can deal with that fear and that stress is using the tools of cognitive behavioral therapy. In the 1960s, one of the leaders on this new field was Dr. Beck. And he realized that the usual approach of you know, the, the, the psychoanalysis that Freud had proposed was actually useless. It didn't work very well. It was uh, research show that that's equivalent to placebo. So instead, he started analyzing the thinking of the patients that were struggling with different mental issues such as depression. And he documented how streams or rivers of negative thoughts seem to come out as spontaneously, he said. In fact, he started documenting those negative thoughts into three groups. One, negative thoughts about the world, negative thoughts about the future, and negative thoughts about themselves. So, he started helping the patients identify those wrong thinking patterns so that they could change those, those patterns of thoughts so that that way he was able to help the patient think more realistical and the patient to feel much better. Now, this is something very interesting. Because as a doctor, I cannot change your thoughts, but I can teach you how you can take responsibility for your own thinking and change the, the, the pattern of the thoughts. So when we have that amygdala turned on, please notice you can see the famous amygdala in the top graphic that little red area in the brain, that's the famous amygdala. So research has shown that CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is one of the best ways of calming down that amygdala because it's like a vicious cycle. You get stress and the stress turns on more fear and the fear makes you more stressed and the stress makes you more fearful. And that cycle starts to go and go and go until the point that some people end up with a panic attack, secondary to that very overacting amygdala. But research is very clear. CVT is not just for the now, but 
And the long term, as you practice those principles, the level of stress starts coming down and down and down. In fact, in a program that I have been involved for more than 14 years, this program takes place in California, this depression program actually helps people improve their hope. See, when fear is on board, you don't have hope. In fact, the way you see things are in a very negative way. But rather, by focusing on the thoughts, what we do, we help the patient start to see that there is another angle that we can see things and that we can react. And as you can see in this study that we did, 95% of our patients, they hope increase. Is that good? It's fantastic, isn't it? Because the reality is that what we think affects who we are. And if the person thinks negative thoughts about themselves, if the person thinks about negative thoughts about the situation, you sometimes start making things worse and worse and worse. So how does this psychoneuroimmunology affect the immune system? It's because there is a two-way street. The brain sends signals through the nerves the nerves are picked up by the hormones. The hormones send signals, and then the rest of the body responds. The blood vessels respond. Your heart responds. Your kidneys respond. Your immune cells respond. And there is a feedback. So those stress areas, they send feedback to the brain. But when you are in that vicious cycle of fear and fear and fear and fear, the signals are confusing and the immune system cannot work properly. And this is what happens when you are, you know, uh, in a normal state of mind and something stressful happened. Well, that stress actually helps you deal with that situation. But when the stress is chronic, is chronic, is chronic, the hormones that are released start going and going and going. You end up entering into a state that is called chronic um, cortisol resistance. The body doesn't even respond to that cortisol. And that makes you more stressed. And that stress releases more, more stress hormone, but at the same time, the body is not reacting properly. And instead of those stress hormones helping us, they actually end up impairing the function of the body and of the mind. So this can end up affecting other areas in your body, such as your pancreas, and you end up with high glucose. It ends up affecting your blood vessels, and you end up with high blood pressure. It ends up affecting with the cells that you have in your bones, and you end up with osteoporosis. It ends up affecting your liver and other systems, and you end up with a high cholesterol, high triglycerides, secondary to stress. Stress can cause high cholesterol and can actually give you heart disease, even if you're on a plant-based diet. That's why this is such an important thing to talk about. And then the messengers around the body start creating what is called an inflammatory state, and the inflammatory state end up affecting your thinking end up affecting your risk of disease and so forth. So the brain starts firing up in areas that usually are seldom used and that starts creating a chronic type of stress situation and it ends up affecting the way we think. Also, 
certain things can affect the function of our brain. For example, somebody that has problems with their weight, the function of the brain is affected secondary to that because the fat cells send signals and end up affecting the brain. So already with that issue and then plus fear, things start getting out of control. Now here comes the good news. Don't get discouraged if you have problems with your weight. Research show, and in a program we have seen this um, uh, first basis, that as you start losing a pound or so, that's enough for that negative effect of the excess body weight to be shut down. That's why I suggest, you know, you keep on, you know, uh, tuning in to the whole uh, series. Uh, this program has follow-up programs in which they do cooking classes and so forth and can teach you, you know, more about what you can practically do to control your weight. So we know that heart disease is affected by this. We know that cancer is affected by this. And as the stress becomes chronic, that's when the problem um, is affected. And again, there are multiple research uh, papers that have shown this relationship. Now, we know that there are many medical conditions that are affected by stress. And in fact, we know that medically, we see more in consultations, those types of people that are in chronic stress, and research shows this very clearly, they come to see the doctor more often, they're hospitalized more, and they have greater risk of shortening their life. So also when we you know try to give treatments to this type of patients and so forth sometimes it's complicated because sometimes chronic stress starts giving you symptomatology that is actually not a physical symptomatology but the origin is in the mind so this has an effect. People come and, 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 and tell us sometimes, this is not all of them, but some subgroup of our patients come and tell us, look, I have this particular problem. You run tests, everything is normal. The laboratories come up normal. And the issue is something up in the head is sending signals there and making that problem worse. So, that is what is called a psychosomatic disease. A disease that is triggered, a symptom that is triggered by our mind, yet when we go and check things, everything seems normal. Now, we have a you know, short time tonight, but we could talk about all this. For example, from insomnia there's people that because of their thinking they get insomnia and this can give you a chronic fatigue type of problem there's people that end up with tinnitus this type of sound in your ears that doesn't go away many times as you deal with the problem which happens to be the control of the thinking the tinnitus goes away at the same time as we as i mentioned to you the mind under very much stress sends the stress hormones. The stress hormones create tension in your body. So that creates tension in the muscles that go to your head. And you end up with this tension headaches. You end up with this pain in the neck that you may think that something is really, really wrong with you. We run MRI and everything. Everything is okay. What the person needs is a good massage and a good way to release that stress. And also related to digestive tract, you have problems such as the irritable bowel syndrome. That is a two problem situation. 
Part of it has to do with the bacteria that inhabit your colon, but a lot of it has to do with the signals that are coming from the mind. Therefore, we need to do cognitive behavioral therapy to teach the mind to calm down so that the signals can decrease. And many times the patient, you know, is given uh, uh, pain medications or they're prescribed something just because they need to give something. But sometimes the issue is that you need to deal with the mind. And, you know, we are complex creatures. And this is what we show in this uh, published paper that we did. Again, you can find this uh, published paper on the ResearchGate page in which we propose that there are multiple groups of things that gives us anxiety and that gives us stress. And what we propose in this um, study is that in order to win the battle, we need to attack it from multiple angles. So cognitive behavioral therapy, as I have been mentioning, that's an essential treatment, but also we need to deal with the nutrition. We need to deal with the exercise. We need to deal with, this, um, with the uh, um, uh, addictions. Uh, we need to deal with it. Uh, with the toxins, we need to deal with it, with the support that we have, our social support. And that was what this uh, um, hypothesis consists of and is very effective. Our research shows that 95% of our patients, as they deal with the root cause of their problem, they will be able to overcome depression and anxiety and chronic fatigue and all these groups of problems. So one of the things that increases when you start doing cognitive behavioral therapy is something that is called EQ, emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence measures five things, which is knowing your emotions, managing your emotions, Please notice that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. When the emotions are out of control, that may tell us that we are not managing those emotions correctly. Recognizing emotions in other, managing relationships, and the fifth factor is the motivation. And this is another one of my studies that we did recently showing how emotional intelligence increases as you put in practice that full program. Our full program consists of the cognitive behavioral therapy plus what we call the new start. N for nutrition, E for exercise, W for water, S for sunlight, T for temperance, which means moderate use of the good things, abstinence of harmful things. A for fresh air, R for rest, and T for trust, which encompasses your relations, your psychological health, health and your spirituality. When you put this program together, it is fantastic and phenomenal to see the results. So we know that emotional, intelligent people tend to think much better than to have more of a, um, a, a clear mind to make better decisions. And this CBT, it has been proven that it's as effective as drug therapy, has no side effects, and makes the probability of relapsing much less likely. So the problem is that our feelings result, and please uh, think about what I'm saying, the messages you give yourself. So that's why it's so important to make sure that we are not feeding that fear. For some people, that means that you need to turn off your television. You need to stop visiting those websites that are just giving you fear and so forth. Instead, focus practically on 
reading things that actually calm down your soul, that give you peace. Your thoughts have much more to do with how you feel than what is actually happening in your life. So one of the principles that we teach with cognitive behavioral therapy is what we call the ABC. The ABC is basically the way that our brain works. Now, this is a way our brain does not work. And this is what is called the AC. So you have an activating event. For example, you read some nasty news. Uh, you are uh, walking and you see a friend and your friend doesn't see you. That's an activating event. Um, you are driving and the police stops you and gives you a ticket and it was not even your, your fault. Um, you are cooking and uh, uh, you get distracted and you burn your food. All the time we have activating events. But here's the important part. The activating event will not directly give you an emotional consequence. See, between the A and the C, there is something. And I can show you this very clearly. We can have 10 people here watching exactly the same thing. How come they react so differently? They just saw the same activating event. For some, this is a huge deal. They're almost about to cry. For another of those 10 people, this actually, they don't even care, you know? And for another, you know, subgroup of those 10 people, they're actually laughing about it. It made him laugh. How come some are crying, some are laughing, and some don't care? Because the activating event does not directly give you an emotional consequence. That is what is called crooked thinking. The thinking is not correct because when if life were to work from A to C, we would be victims. There is absolutely nothing we can do. And we are at the mercy of the activating events. That is not the way that life works. Instead, the way that our brain works is the following. You have A, activating events, B, belief system, C, emotional consequence. For example, you may say, oh, nobody should tell me anything about the fact that I'm bald. That's your thinking. Question, what happens if somebody approaches you and tells you, hey, you know, you're bald. Man, you're going to boil in anger. Yes or no? See, the problem was not that they were telling you that. The problem was that your belief system was already prepared to give you that consequence. Therefore, instead of running away from the activating events, what we need to do, we need to start focusing on our basic beliefs and values. Those are the ones we can change. Now, we don't have time to talk about this tonight, but there are... 10 wrong ways of thinking. Let me just go like very briefly through each one of them. You have what is called the all or nothing thinking in which you see life as black or white. Overgeneralization in which from a few examples, you start making a pattern. Mental filter in which you see life like with glasses that are dirty. So it's not very clear what, what you are thinking. Disqualifying the positive in which you're just focusing on the negative side of things and you are unable to see the positive side. Mind reading in which you think you know what the other person is thinking before asking them. Nobody can mind read. Fortune error teller, this one in which you think you know tomorrow before tomorrow arrives. Again, you cannot tell tomorrow. 
magnification minimization in which you make something into a big big deal that's what the media was doing as i told you about the coronavirus they were magnificating yes it was bad and so forth but these people would throw even more gasoline to the fire emotional reasoning in which you are reasoning with your emotions labeling and mislabeling in which you put labels on yourself on others and then you start acting based on those labels and finally personalization in which you start getting blame that is inappropriate guilt of things that are not even your fault but yet you take that fault so this cognitive behavioral therapy can be summarized in a practical way by the following citation. Notice how fantastic this principle is on what to think. Summing it up, up, friends, I say you do, you will do best by filling your mind and meditating on things. And please notice what we need to be thinking: things that are true, things that are noble, things that are reputable things that are authentic, things that are compelling, things that are gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not to curse. So anytime you are thinking and you catch yourself, try to match that to this principle. Is what I'm thinking true? Is what I'm thinking novel? Is what I'm thinking reputable? Is what I'm thinking of good name? Is what I'm thinking the best, not the worst? Is what I'm thinking is the beautiful, not the ugly? So in that way, you can have that type of thinking that will help you have the best outcome. And... Um, I'm gonna show you uh, one of the practical things we can do. Number one, what can we do to stop living in fear? We need to stop feeding the fear. So stop it. If you identify something that is triggering you that fear, well, shut it down, avoid it. And in closing, this is a nice principle um, found on scripture that says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear has to do with self. Fear has to do when the anxiety comes in, when the panic comes in, when the anger comes in. But it says there, out of power. In other words, there is power accessible to each one of us so that we can change the tune. This is exactly what Alcoholic Anonymous does. Alcoholic Anonymous, what they do, they take you to those 12 steps. And those 12 steps, the one of them is you need to give up and give it to God. And that is what you can do. Take that fear and take it to the right place. But of love, says the verse. In other words, if you are just focusing on yourself, you're going to be feeding the anxiety, the panic, the anger. But when you have love in action, you start sharing, you start giving, you start volunteering, you start helping others, something happens. You become more happy. And finally, of a sound mind. As you start applying these principles, your amygdala comes down, your rational thinking improves, and then you will have peace, joy, and Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And um, there's an opportunity to answer a few questions. And now would be the time to answer 
those questions. You're muted, Adrian. Adrian, you're muted. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, appreciate it. Ramirez. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ramirez. <laughs> I think I, met, I, I did that uh, one other time. And John corrected me. And here I am doing it uh, another time. Um, yeah. OK. Well, um, Thank you. A lot of information, and uh, I probably need to go and uh, watch it again. So uh, we'll, uh, you know, all that information will uh, will sink in. Um, let me uh, quickly say hi to my colleagues here, uh, John, Pastor John, uh, Pastor of the Elmhurst Church. Welcome. Okay. Uh, I hope it's not uh, going to happen the same with uh, with Paul. Um, I'm afraid to say hi to Paul, so he will not disappear. Paul, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful sharing, Dr. Eddie. Um, Thank you. I want to uh, ask you quickly, just a brief uh, question um, for each one of you. Do you have a, a phobia? Hmm. Any, anything that you are afraid of? <laughs> As, as a kid, I had so many. I, as, as a child, I remember I was afraid of cobweb. And I couldn't differentiate between cobweb and cotton wool. And so my older brother and siblings, they would scare me with cotton wool. All they had to do was hold cotton wool in front of me. And I thought it was cobweb, and I would freak out. <laughs> as an adult, um, no, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm reckless. I don't have many phobias that I can immediately think of. <laughs> okay okay anyone else wants to to share maybe a shot needle needle <laughs> well, that, that, that phobia we all have it <laughs> okay um I, I, i'll, I'll be uh, worried if you don't have that phobia but yeah, anyhow. yeah. <laughs> let's go to uh dr ramirez um uh, how does fear affect um, my immune system? And maybe you can tell us briefly what uh, is the function of the immune system too. Yep. Yeah, so, so the immune system is the one in charge of uh, you know, attacking uh, any foreign pathogen that comes into your body. Uh, so um, uh, as we said, your mood affects your immune system. When you're happy and joyful and peaceful, your immune system is uh, working at the maximum, you know. But when you are sad, when you are fearful, when you are depressed, the immune system also goes down and the ability of the fear to take over you that's a problem because the immune system is not able to function at 100%. So that's how the, um, uh, the, uh, the fear uh, affects us, our immune system. Thank you, doctor. I, I, I have a question also, Adrian, um, yeah. for, for Dr. Ramirez, and, and that is listening to the presentation and you speaking of psychoneuroimmunology is psychoneuroimmunology positive thinking or, or is it a lot more than positive thinking it's like a pie and positive thinking is a little piece of that pie there is much more to that so yes you know um there's things that we can listen to that are positive that affect our mood I just gave you a citation by a, a, a somebody that I like to listen to, Zig Ziglar. If you have never heard this man, <laughs> go to the internet and put it there on your YouTube. You know, just listening to him, you know, his positivity just comes to you. You know, you become positive just by listening to him because the guy is funny and, 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 and so forth. So that's what you need to do. You need to start feeding your mind with positive things. Um, that's a one possibility, you know, uh, listening to positive people make you react in a positive way. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. May I ask something? Uh, because there is a question on the screen that was asked that somebody is afraid of spiders. And, right. and my son is afraid of spiders. And I'm trying in any way to encourage him not to be there. They are little creatures. They are not dangerous or anything. How do we deal with this? When how uh, how mind works? How can I help my boy to, to, to overcome this? That's right. Yeah, there's different strategies to deal with uh, phobias, um, depending um, the the severity and so forth. Sometimes you can start exposing yourself to the fear little by little, you know, start seeing the spider a little bit from far away and then a little bit closer the next day and so forth and start to um, face that fear. That's one possibility of, of dealing with the phobia. Another one is by changing the belief system, by analyzing why are you being so afraid? And oh. as you start analyzing the root cause, maybe a spider bit you in the past, Maybe, you know, something else caused that trigger and you are relating that fear to that spider. So you need to come down to the root part of things. There's a good book. Um, if you want to get that book, it's called SOS Help for Emotions. And the author is Lynn Clark. Uh, talking a little bit about, you know, um, uh, fears and so forth and practical things we can do to change, you know, that pattern and dealing with those belief systems and changing them. But, but that is that is quite interesting. That is applying only for the spiders, not to virus. I cannot get closer and closer to vice virus. <laughs> yeah, well, for the, the virus has to do with our, our belief system. See, there's people that think, oh, I'm going to get it. It doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to get it. If I get the vaccine, I don't, I'll get it. See, that is the mistake of thinking that we just talked about a minute ago, the fortune error thinking. You think that you know tomorrow before tomorrow arrives. You don't, you know, you do not know that. Also, sometimes has to do with a misunderstanding of that virus. You know, learn more about it. Read solid, encouraging information. Like the book that I was uh, sharing with you, uh, that one of the goals of that book is to calm you down, to show you the real perspective and shows you practical things you can do. Instead of just sitting down and fearing, what can you actually change so that you can decrease that risk of infection? Thank you. We have a, we have a question that came in uh, from uh, uh, Lecre. Um, how do we reconcile CBT with a Christian premise that we are sinners and our nature is bad and maybe you can uh, um, I, I hope there is no confusion you talked about CBT so Tom T uh, and and uh, you know versus CBD as in Douglas you know <laughs> yeah 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 you know no, CBD, you know, is this oil that comes from marijuana. That's not what we were talking about today. <laughs> we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, answering, uh, looks like it's a Christian, the one that asked me that question. So I'm going to give you a uh, Christian answer. This is actually what the Bible teaches. So cognitive behavioral therapy means cognitive, your thinking, behavioral your behavior and therapy means treatment, a treatment to change the thinking, okay, in order to change the behavior. That's basically the message of the Bible. In the Bible, it teaches that God works in our thinking and our behavior changes. So it ensembles perfectly with that uh, uh, message there. So 
Yes, they are both fully compatible and they are actually the application of that message. I just show you um, Philippians, you know, uh, which is a, a, a principle from there, which is the application of CPT. Thank you. Thank you. So the Bible talks about renewing your mind or let this mind be new, which was also in, in Christ. So it's a process of transformation. Thank you. Um, guys, do we have uh, time for one more question? What do you think? Maybe one more, and I'm interested, the, if I may. Uh, that is the question. What else can we do? You mentioned at the beginning hydrotherapy, but is there something else that we can do to, uh, to boost the immune system? Go to pandemicbusters.org. <laughs> um, I mentioned there multiple things. One of them is exercise. Another one is sleep. Another one is dressing correctly. Another one is um, having a gratitude journal. You know, that changes the way how we feel as we start becoming more and more, you know, grateful. Um, another thing that we can do, we can improve our diet. We need to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. And uh, in continuation with what you're talking about, get the guy that I was mentioning, you know, go to Francisco Ramirez Research Gate. And it's like the second or third thing that is posted there. It is that guide. I'm going to put it in my Twitter at the end of the of the meeting. If somebody just wants to visit my Twitter and you can actually get that guide also there out of my my Twitter so that uh, you can um, uh, read it. It's free. You know, you don't have to pay absolutely anything for that guide. And you can see the practical things you can do to strengthen that immune system. Uh, thank you, guys, and thank you, Dr. Um, Ramirez. Uh, we don't want to take uh, too much of your time. We know that you are, uh, you know, the time where you're at right now is even later than Chicago time. Yes. So you need to take some, uh, some rest so you won't uh, be stressed tomorrow. So mm -hmm. uh, what will be something like a summary or, uh, you know, an encouragement that you have for our uh, viewers tonight. And I, I want to thank them also for sending in their questions and their comments. Yes. So there is a powerful verse that is the principle I was telling you is found in 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That basically summarizes what I am trying to communicate to you, that God wants the best from us. And by fearing, by going in the, you know, the, the wrong side of our thinking, we actually end up um, blurring our thinking, we actually end up affecting the way that we think. So let us work on the root causes of the problem. I'm going to uh, recommend you another book. And that's a book that every single one of our patients read. That book is called Telling Yourself the Truth. And uh, the, the author is William Backhus. And basically, the hypothesis of this author is that things that are not true tend to be the things that stress us the most. Therefore, try to put things into perspective. Try to find the truth behind things, and the truth will make you free. May God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I hope to see you in another time. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul and John. Um, if uh, you want to see Dr. Ramirez again, he will be on part of the panel uh, on Friday night where uh, we are going to try to bring in as many of our presenters as possible. You are also invited to, uh, to come back tomorrow night at 7.30, same time, 
Uh, and we are going to have as our guest presenter, Dr. Mark Sandoval. And he's going to talk about the fear of illness. Um, please invite your friends and thank you all for your, your comments, your questions. If we didn't get to your question, um, forgive us and we'll try to bring those in uh, maybe on Friday night or at least uh, uh, respond to those in uh, private. So keep them coming. Um, we'll end up with, uh, with a song. And we want to thank um, Fountain View Academy for uh, graciously allowing us to use this song for, uh, for our program. And uh, as the immune system protects our body, Martin Luther, the great reformer, thought about God as a mighty fortress. And this is what the song is going to talk about. Listen to the words, be inspired, and thank you for choosing Hope Route. See you tomorrow night. God bless you.
Amen. Mm-hmm. 